Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Ralston College podcast. Today, we have the very distinguished physicist and entrepreneur, a legend in those circles, Stephen Wolfram, the creator of Wolfram Alpha, in conversation with Ralston College's students. I want to say just something very brief about Dr. Wolfram, and that is that though he never finished high school and then he left Oxford without a degree, you might say this sounds like a trajectory of failure, but in fact, it was a trajectory of genius. He went on to, re to earn a PhD in physics in only a year to become the youngest ever recipient of a MacArthur Genius Award, and then to, to create one of the most successful and important pieces of tech infrastructure the world has ever seen in Wolfram Research. It's precisely that genius and independence that makes what he says in today's conversation so powerful. He believes we are at a moment in which there is a historic opportunity and indeed necessity, especially with respect to AI, for the humanities. The fact is, we have a kind of tsunami coming in the form of artificial intelligence. The question is whether and how we will be able to control the very machines we have created. There will be no way of answering those questions except through the humanities. In other words, today's conversation is directly about one of the most pressing and fundamental questions of our time. I hope you enjoy it, and thanks for listening. It is a great pleasure to welcome everyone. I know people are still uh, streaming into the Zoom room here, uh, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and get started. It's, a, it's an enormous pleasure today to welcome uh, Dr. Stephen Wolfram uh, to uh, this uh, Friday afternoon Q&A. This is designed as a Q&A uh, with Dr. Wolfram. That's the main event. Uh, uh, he's uh, been very gracious to uh, open his schedule to spend some time with us today. And really, this was designed from the beginning, not uh, as a talk, uh, but as a chance for all of you to ask questions of Dr. Wolfram. And uh, by way of just a, a little bit of an introduction, I'd like to say that uh, one of the things, one of the many things I find inspiring about Dr. Wolfram is, as perhaps many of you already know from having heard me say this before, is his utterly extraordinarily uh, independently minded trajectory uh, through life and indeed especially through his early education. He uh, started at a prestigious uh, boys' school uh, called Eton College in uh, the United Kingdom. Uh, very unusually, he did not finish uh, there. He then went off uh, to begin uh, a degree uh, at uh, at St. John's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, at uh, at uh, at uh, the University of Oxford, if I got that right, Steve. Oh, yeah, that's uh, yep. And uh, also did not take a degree there. He is, uh, I think, the the only person I've ever heard of uh, whose first degree was uh, an advanced uh, subspecialty of uh, uh, of science uh, at at, a do at the doctoral level. So uh, he didn't uh, finish high school, though he had written a book of uh, a physics textbook uh, as a teenager. Uh, he uh, had a very, you might say, eccentric but uh, astonishing and impressive uh, trajectory of the sort that I think it needs to be said. Uh, uh, most parents today would wildly uh, disprove of. It would be considered, uh, uh, you know, a failure to, you know, to 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 leave public school, an, an elite public school, and then to be admitted uh, to Oxford and not to take a degree. Uh, but I, I want to I want to dwell on this by way of an introduction uh, because uh, intellectual independence and and the having the courage to chart the course that you think is best is I believe one of the most uh, fundamental ingredients to a flourishing society in which persons are able to realize their uh, particular talents and fundamentally I think it is an ingredient to uh, a flourishing and uh, satisfactory life. Uh, Dr. Wolfram has, uh, uh, as you all know, uh, 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 subsequent to his uh, his doctoral degree, uh, founded Wolfram Research, Wolfram Alpha. Uh, he uh, is the founder of it of uh, a t of a technology uh, that is used uh, worldwide, used in every university, uh, every significant university around the world. Uh, it is uh, in uh, uh, all of the devices that we all carry with us in our pockets day by day. 
Uh, he is a, a, a physicist of uh, extraordinary repute, and it is an enormous pleasure to welcome you here today, uh, Dr. Wolfram. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. So what do you guys want to talk about? We could talk about, um, you know, I, I've been lucky enough in my life to, as um, as Stephen was saying there, to to be able to just work on things that I think I want to work on. And I, you know, that partly happened because I was fairly successful fairly early in life in fairly traditional kinds of things in academia. And that both gave me kind of practical sort of credentials and personal confidence to just say, okay, I can go figure out something sort of that just because nobody's figured it out for the last 50 years doesn't mean I can't figure it out, so to speak. And that's a, I mean, some would call that outrageous arrogance. Some would call that useful, practical confidence, so to speak. Um, it's, uh, I, you know, it, it's turned out I've, I've ended up sort of alternating between doing basic science and doing technology development about five times so far in my life. And that's also been really powerful because, you know, a lot of progress in science gets made when a new methodology, new tools start to exist. Usually, you know, the pattern of the history of science tends to be some new tools, some new methodology come into existence. And then there's a period of five, 10, 20 years or something when there's lots of low-hanging fruit to be picked from what you can figure out from those new tools, new, new methodologies and so on. And so I'd been involved in building a bunch of these tools and then uh, picking the fruit, so to speak, that becomes accessible uh, from those new tools. And then what I found somewhat surprisingly in many cases is that the science that I think of as being very basic science that's of intellectual interest, but I'm not sure where it connects to sort of what's practical, ends up showing me new areas of technology, which I can then build things on and then go through this loop. And so it's been this kind of tall tower of, of science and technology. And I would say the main things that, uh, well, where have I got to right now? Uh, one direction is our physics project and trying to understand kind of how our universe is built. And one of the things that's led me to in recent times is things about sort of the fundamentals of the universe, the relationship that we have as sort of observers of the universe, how that all fits together, this thing I call the Rouliad, which is this kind of uh, unique, inevitable uh, sort of conflation of all possible computational processes and the way that we exist within that. And that's led me to things which I realized are kind of fundamental philosophical questions. And I've been kind of shocked. You know, I, I, um, uh, I really had never learned a lot about philosophy. My mother happened to be a philosophy professor in Oxford back when I was a kid. And one of the things that I would always say is, there's one thing I'll never do when I'm grown up, it's philosophy. And look what do philosophers do. They're still arguing about the same things they argued about 2,000 years ago. How can this possibly be a sensible thing to be doing? But now, as I, um, now that I'm ancient, well, actually, I found myself thrust into all of these philosophical questions, but with a, with a kind of a new set of tools that come from science. And there are a lot of really, I think, pretty significant and interesting things. And I, I keep on trying to study things that, you know, philosophers did, you know, 2,000, 500, whatever years ago and saying, gosh, I think I actually understand that now and can see scientifically how that works. So that's been sort of a, a, a fun thing for me, for me recently and um, sort of trying to, I think we really got a good handle now on sort of what, how our universe fundamentally works, which is pretty neat. So that's, that's one thing I've been really interested in. Another thing I've been really interested in is kind of using computation as a way to formalize everything in the world. And I guess the way I would think of this right now is if you think about, you know, we, we have the world as it is, and we start saying, uh, how do we talk about the world? Well, we, first of all, we, we come up with words, we come up with human language, and we point at things and we say, you know, that's a chair or something like that. We have kind of this, this abstracted representation of not having to just say that's the particular you know collection of pieces of wood, but that's generically a chair, and we can abstract that idea. And so, sort of human language, I view as being sort of our first big formalization of the world. Then, then the things like logic is another kind of formalization of the world, a way of describing, a way of abstracting from the particulars of the world some kind of more uh, 
more idealized, more symbolic representation. Then there's mathematics, which really got serious as far as I'm concerned in the 1600s with kind of the application of, of mathematics to science. And that's another kind of formalization of the world that's taken us a long way. And, you know, in my particular personal trajectory, you know, made quite a good living out of sort of uh, being able to to automate sort of that formalization of the world. But there's another formalization of the world, which is computation. And sort of the, the essence of that formulation is that once you are specifying things by rules, there's the question, well, what are the consequences of those rules? In a sense, that's, I think, the, the ultimate way of thinking about computation. Computation is sort of what happens when you follow rules. And so that has sort of two branches for me. One branch is, okay, you just write down those rules and pick them. You just enumerate all possible rules. What do they do? Big thing that I discovered in the 1980s is that even if the rules are simple, the behavior they may generate may be extremely complicated. So complicated that, that well, they, they look to us random, for example. Very important idea that I think has many consequences um, is an idea I call computational irreducibility. So you might say, and you might think, based on a lot of what people talk about in science, if you know the rules by which something operates, you're kind of done. This is It's like we know the fundamental rules, then we know how the thing's going to work. But it's not true. Just because you know the fundamental rules doesn't mean there's a way to globally say what the system will do. Rather, you may be in a situation where you kind of have to just follow step by step by step, just applying these rules. And so that phenomenon I call computational irreducibility, that you can't know what's going to happen in the system except by following each step and seeing what it does. So that has a bunch of consequences. It means that, for example, when you ask in, in science, people sort of say, oh, well, now we have a scientific explanation of this thing so we can answer every question about it. It's not true. The computational irreducibility is kind of the evidence that science has sort of built-in limitations that arise from within science itself. So in any case, one sort of branch of kind of thinking about things computationally is this idea of sort of exploring the computational universe of possible programs, seeing what phenomena occur there. That's one branch. The other branch is there's all this stuff that's computationally possible. We humans have certain kinds of things we want to do. Let's understand how we connect sort of what we humans want to do with what's computationally possible. And that's led to my sort of 40-year effort to build our computational language that is a way of taking the things we humans think about and formulating those thoughts not in human natural language, but instead in this kind of precise computational language, which allows us to kind of sort of formalize our thoughts and then, by the way, get a computer to help us work out the consequences. So that's my, my main day job, in a sense, is uh, creating that computational language and you know, lots of people use it, and uh, lots of people in, involved in kind of pushing back the frontiers of, of new things use it. I would say that in you know, many decades from now, it, more people who just do things that have already been done before will use it too, but uh, although they may not know they're using it, it's probably already true that there are lots of people who use it and don't know they're using it. Um, but uh, kind of that's been a big effort to kind of um, uh, sort of uh, represent the world computationally, build this language where you can sort of automate how you're thinking about things, invent kind of this these ideas like computational essays, where you're kind of describing things in the world by a mixture of you know English language or whatever language you use, and um, uh, and maybe math, and then computational language, where the computational language, like mathematical notation, is kind of communicating ideas right sort of there in the language, so to speak. So in any case, that, that's, that's sort of a big thing I've been doing. I, I suppose one project of, um, I have a bunch of things I'm working on right now, but one of the ones that I just started, which I had been hoping I would not have to do, but anyway, I'm, I'm doing it, is, is to write a kind of textbook and course about computational thinking. I just started doing this and I thought, I know this subject really well. I've been thinking about this for 45 years. Um, but actually, as is often the case, it's harder than you think to kind of capture sort of the the uh, uh, the, the things you never bothered to write down because they seem so obvious to you. Now it's a question of capturing those. So I, I just embarked on this project, and um, 
uh, I suppose chapters of it will start appearing on the web before too long, and um, uh, people might find it interesting. Anyway, that, that's a, that's a, a bit of a, a ramble about some things that I've been up to, and um, maybe that's a, a launching point for questions. Please, I see a, a virtual hand. Go ahead. Well, first off, thank you so much for being here with us. Um, I am so grateful you started off by talking about this concept of computational irreducibility, because it makes me think of a way to maybe link some of what you're talking about back to what we're studying here. A huge part of our theme this year in the program at Ralston is talking about the parts and the whole. And of course, we're accessing that in a large way through literature, but it makes me maybe in realms that you dabble in a lot more, think of concepts like emergence, which is something that I find super fascinating, or the idea of something that I've heard called like a gestalt entity. Um, and the fact that you can measure things differently as parts or as a whole and actually come out with some sort of different quanta as you measure them in that way, I think is fascinating and relates to what we're talking about. But to phrase my question in a somewhat cogent way, I guess, is that a suggestion uh, to take in a broader sense that there could potentially be subjectivity in the realms of, of physics or of math? Is there a subjectivity to that? And if so, what does that look like and what does that tell us? And if not, how come that's just apparent? Yeah, right. So yes, uh, I think that the universe, the laws of physics are the way they are because we are the way we are. So let me try and unpack that. So let's see. This is a this is a deep rabbit hole. So I'm not sure we can let let's let's go down this road. Um. So first first thing is is let me see if I can. Well, let, let me show you something. So this is this is kind of um. Uh, see this? Okay. Let me show you a a typical, very simple program that um uh. Just a, a little rule that says we've got a, a line of black and white cells, and at each step, we figure out the color of the next cell by looking at the colors of the cells right above it and to its left and right, according to this rule. Okay, so let, let's run this rule and um, uh, just say we run things according to this rule, um, and this... Okay, that's just applying that rule. We start off with that black cell at the top, and then we just apply the rule over and over again. Very simple rule, we get a very simple pattern. Okay, but we can sort of think of this, there's a sort of whole computational universe of possible rules. And for example, let, let's say we can make, um, say there are, there are, let's say we pick up first, let's do this, first 64 rules of a particular kind here. So let's say this, and um, uh, there we go. So there are a bunch of little rules that are all of this kind, but they have slightly different patterns of what's supposed to happen in different cases. Okay, so now we can say, well, what does happen if we just start off with one black cell in all those different cases? Let's just try that. Um, And just say, make a table of all of those things. It's kind of like turning a computational telescope out to look at the computational universe and see what's there. And what we see is there's all these different patterns that come. Each one of these comes from applying a different set of rules, sort of a different artificial physics. And what we see is sometimes we'll get these patterns that are these nested patterns. Sometimes we'll just get stripes and so on. But the really surprising thing is that sometimes, even though the rule is very simple, we'll get much more complicated patterns. And that's that's kind of the, um, this one is 30 and this kind of enumeration of possible rules. And let, let's see what it actually does. So we can say, this is rule 30. There it is at the beginning. Let's run it a bit longer. And um, this is our kind of quintessential example of computational irreducibility, emergence, these are all closely related concepts, but this is something where the rule is really simple. We can let's just show the rule here. Um, that's the rule, and that very simple rule. If you started off with just one black square, makes this picture here. And 
So this is something where if we ask, well, what's going to happen after a billion steps? Well, we can run the rule for a billion steps and see. But the question is, can we do the thing that you might expect you can do based on kind of mathematical science ideas and just sort of predict, jump ahead, say the answer is going to be 17 or something? And the answer is you can't do that. Computational irreducibility says you can't do that. Why can't you do that? Well, the reason you can't do that is because if you want to jump ahead, you as the human observer have to be more sophisticated than the system itself. So in other words, it's going through, it's doing a certain computation to figure out what's going to happen, but you've got to be smarter than it is. And you've got to say, I can jump ahead. I can. It spent a billion steps to do this, but it was wasting most of its time. I can just jump ahead and say this is the answer. Computational. The, the 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 real question is: Is it the case that we could be computationally more sophisticated than the system so that we can do that jumping ahead? And there's this thing I call the principle of computational equivalence, which is this idea that that won't be the case; that we are computationally equivalent to this system, and that's what leads to computational irreducibility. Because as soon as we are just as we are. That the system is as computationally capable as we are, we cannot expect that we can reduce its computational effort. We're sort of stuck being at the same level as the system. That's kind of where computational irreducibility comes from. Now, okay, so this idea that you can start off with a very simple rule and generate this very complicated pattern of behavior, the obvious question to then ask is what about the whole universe? Maybe the whole universe works that way. Maybe the whole universe just has some simple rule that we can follow. And it will, from that simple rule, will generate sort of the the uh, um, the whole universe. And well, it turns out that actually that's true. The um, let's see if I can find a good example well, here. I can show you this kind of visual summary. Um, and uh, so this is a version of something like that simple computational rule I just showed. Its details are different. It starts by asking, what's the universe made of? And in this model, the universe is made of space. The only thing in the universe is space. And then the question is, what's space made of? And for the last couple of thousand years, people have kind of assumed that space is just this background that you put things in. It's one of the sort of launching points for, for what we realized in the last few years is that that's not really the right picture. We like saying, if I take some water, water is just this thing that flows around that doesn't really have any internal structure, just this fluid that flows. But actually, we know water is made of discrete molecules. That's something we've known for the last 130 years or so, not longer than that, for, for, with any degree of certainty. People thought that might be the case 2,000 years ago, but it wasn't really known with certainty until about 130 years ago. But um, with respect to space, People have generally assumed that space is just a continuous thing where you just put things wherever you want in space. Kind of the launching point for what we've thought about is space is actually made of discrete stuff. There are atoms of space, not like physical atoms that make materials, but, but just idealized atoms, idealized elements, points in space. And all you get to say is how those points are related. You get, build this kind of graph that represents the relations between the atoms of space. And then what's time? Well, time is the continual rewriting, the continual kind of computational rewriting of this structure of space. And okay, there's there's lots of things to say about this, and it's it's really very beautiful how this theory has come together, and kind of the way in which sort of fluid behavior emerges from a bunch of molecules bouncing around turns out to be the same way that things like gravity emerge from these atoms of space being related in this network and so on. But the important thing is that you can start from this very simple rule. You can end up uh, at, with this kind of thing that, on a large scale, seems like uh, sort of have the characteristics of space. And you can then uh, that. So, in other words, you, you start from the simple rule and you end up with something which seems like physical space. Now, one of the things that's important there is. It seems like physical space to an observer that's a bit like us. So let me give an analogy. There's a, um, a big idea from the 1800s that sort of got kind of nailed down by the end of the 1800s as the second law of thermodynamics. The thing that tells you that sort of 
systematic mechanical work tends to be dissipated into heat. You And heat is kind of the random motion of molecules, and you don't get things back from being kind of random like that. And there's been sort of a long-term mystery of how this really works, because at the level of individual molecules, you can always reverse things, but yet, you know, eggs get scrambled, but they don't get unscrambled as we observe them. And so this is an example of where what, what happens sort of depends on the observer. To, to an observer who is able to trace sort of every trajectory of every molecule here, this, the fact that this looks random is really, they can tell that isn't true because they can tell that, that this came from this, this simple initial setup. If you can sort of do the computations at the level of individual molecules, you know that you had a simple origin here. The thing that um, the the um, the um the thing that um, the reason we believe in the second order of thermodynamics is because we are computationally bounded observers. We cannot untangle the randomness, so it looks to us like oh, it's just random just random heat. If we were observers different from the way we are, if we were observers who had much more computational capabilities, we would not believe the segment of thermodynamics. So that's, a, that's a case where this fundamental law of physics is a consequence of the fact that we are the way we are. Now, it turns out that the same is true for the theory of gravity. The same is true for quantum mechanics. These are things that have emerged from what we've done in the last few years. And so let's see, the, the sort of the, 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 the deepest part of the rabbit hole is this. So you say, well, you know, I can have a rule and that rule might generate features of the universe. But then you ask, well, why is it this rule and not another rule? You know, it seems like it's very anti-Copernican. It's like, why did we get rule number 714, so to speak? What about all the other rules? Where, where, where are they? And what we realized is that actually the way to think about this is that all possible rules are being applied. And in fact, the way that things work in quantum mechanics, it's, it's generating many different histories. That's talking about a single rule getting applied in many ways, but also all possible rules are getting applied. And so what you have is a much more complicated setup here, not just this network that has grown from, from particular ways to rewrite these connections between atoms of space, but rather the thing you get from all possible ways to, to sort of uh, do these updates. And that object is this strange thing we call the Rouliad, which is the kind of entangled limit of all possible computations, which you might think, well, how can that be anything interesting? What, well, it's kind of a long story how, how the Rouliad ends up having a lot of structure. Okay, why is this relevant to, to how we perceive things? The point is that we are embedded inside this Rouliad. We are a part of this Rouliad. And so the question of how we perceive reality is how does this entity embedded within the Rouliad perceive the Rouliad? We are effectively sampling some slice of the Rouliad. And it turns out that we, and, and so different slices of the Rouliad will give us different conclusions about the way the world is. Much like if we live on this planet in this galaxy, we'll have some view of the universe. We'll have a different point of view about the universe if we live in some other galaxy or something like this. But similarly, sort of where we are in this, what we call rural space, in the space of possible, uh, sort of possible ways that rules can be applied, that gives us sort of a different point of view about the universe. And so, you know, for example, my view of it these days is that every mind exists at a particular point in real space. And minds that are sort of similar are nearby in real space. Minds that are far away uh, will have a different, very different view of the universe. And it's kind of like, you know, we humans with somewhat similar educational backgrounds or something can readily communicate. We're not far away in real space. Something like the weather also is doing computations. Also, it kind of has a mind of its own but that mind is far away in real space and not one that we can sort of readily communicate with. But so the big surprise is how can one actually say anything in this situation? It turns out that just a couple of attributes of us as observers 
are sufficient to tell us a lot about how we observe things. So the attributes that turn out to be important are that we are computationally bounded and that we believe we are persistent in time. So, you know, at every moment in time, we are made of different atoms of space. Yet we think that we experience a definite thread of, of, of existence, so to speak. And those two facts, belief in persistence in time and our computational boundedness, those two facts are sufficient inevitably to give us theory of gravity, theory of space-time, and quantum mechanics, and actually also the second law of thermodynamics. So these things, which are the sort of the cornerstones of what was in 20th century physics, turn out to all be consequences of the fact that we are observers of the general kind we are. So, you know, the aliens, if they are observers that have those attributes in common with us, will experience the same laws of physics. But if they have quite different attributes, they will experience different laws of physics. So the laws of physics are, in a sense, then dependent on sort of the observer who's observing them. There, what, what's really kind of interesting about this is it, it's sort of, there is an ultimate there there. It is this Rouillard object. The Rouillard is an inevitable formal object. There's only one of it. You can't, you can't sort of say, well, the world could be different and there could be a different Rouillard. No, there's one such thing. Once you've sort of formally defined, it's like saying two plus two equals four. Once you define the two and the plus and the equals and so on, that is an inevitable object. The Rouillard is like that. And then the question is the contingent thing is how we, how we are as observers. And so the fact that we perceive gravity and things like this is a consequence, it seems, of those features of us as observers. So in a sense, it's both a way of understanding that to every observer, there is some relative, there's some different view of the world, but yet, insofar as observers like us have these general characteristics, those general characteristics are sufficient to give us these big features of the world that are captured in the laws of physics. So I'm not sure if that was a, a um, truly responsive to what you asked, but perhaps um, uh, perhaps it gives some flavor of, of um, uh, the, the kind of thinking, so to speak. Thank you very much, Dr. Wolfram. I think I did see another hand with Mackay. Uh, yes, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Wolfram. First of all, because your tools have been very helpful for me. So I was very surprised to hear that you were going to talk to us because it felt so different from what we're doing here at Ralston. But I mean, I had a few questions about what you were talking about right now, but I guess bringing in more towards education. Uh, lately, you know, we've been talking a little about Plato and the Republic, and Plato talks a lot about education and how we should educate from arithmetic to geometry, 3D geometry, eventually to harmonics. But I think times have changed quite a bit. And now that you mentioned all the interests that you have, physics and mathematics, computational, um, and now that you're writing a book about computational thinking, what do you think is the most important thing to teach young people? Do you think it's computational thinking? And that's, that's, that's I think important. that is an important one. Let me say one thing about that. I mean, you know, one thing that's sort of interesting about writing a book about any kind of thinking is this book is mostly about facts. It's not mostly about the abstraction of thinking. It's mostly about, uh, you know, like I was just writing a section about logic. And it's about how logic works and what you can do with logic and so on. And it's, it's not, you know, you will learn from reading the section, you should, if I did my job correctly, learn a whole bunch of stuff about logic. And, but you'll do it in the framework of kind of computation, which, by the way, makes it easier to understand a lot of things about logic. So the kind of, to me, it's a, it's, you know, as Plato, I think, felt that geometry and, you know, this kind of deductive system of Euclid and so on, that was a, a formalization of thinking. And that was something that Plato, I think, thought was important. This, this idea that it isn't just, you're not just vaguely thinking about things, you're uh, you're kind of, um, you know, you're kind of nailing it down as something which you can sort of formally build with, you know, brick after brick, so to speak, as you can in 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 kind of uh, in, in geometrical deduction, and you know, subsequently with logic, that's another, and you know, later on, you know, syllogistic logic, later more modern forms of logic, 
it's again a thing where you can take sort of the vagueness of how you're thinking and try and turn it into something that is formalized. Now, the fact is what we get now is with kind of computational thinking, it's a big generalization of that idea of formalizing things. And I don't think we've fully landed on what's possible with that kind of formalization. I mean, you know, mathematics, what was made possible by the formalization that mathematics provides is pretty big in the world. What's made possible by the formalization that computation provides, we're in the very early stages of understanding the significance of that for, for everything. I mean, you know, the, the idea of computational philosophy, you know, basically for every field X, there's a computational X that you can think about. And it's a way of sort of formalizing that field. And it has this extra feature, this real major kicker, which is, and your computer can help you then. Because, you know, you formalize with mathematics and it's nice and it gives you a way to be systematic. But, you know, unless you're using our computational tools or something, you're kind of on your own. It's it's still just you've got to run the mathematics in your in your mind, so to speak. With computational kinds of once you formulate things computationally, there's an immediate, you know, you immediately get this sort of superpower of and you can get your computer to actually actually do stuff, so to speak. So, I mean, I think that's, I mean, to my mind, sort of computation as a way to formalize thinking about the world, but it is not a substitute for facts about the world. And what turns out to be the case is many facts about the world are easier to understand and they sort of fit together in this kind of computational framework. And that's my attempt and what I'm writing. You know, there are going to be sections in this book about biology. There are going to be sections about calculus. There are going to be sections about these kinds of things. And the concept, we'll see how successful I am, is that, you know, given that you understand the fundamental ideas of computation, understanding calculus is easy. And that it's only if you want to build it from the sand up without those kinds of ideas, without that kind of formalization, that it seems really hard to get to. We'll see. Um, I, I've certainly done experiments of explaining that to middle school kids and things like this. It seemed to work fairly well. So I'm, I have some degree of confidence. This is, you know, you, uh, at the beginning, we talked about kind of how one manages to do sort of independently thinking kinds of things. And, you know, one feature of my life, at least, is I keep on doing things that I think are hard. Um, you know, in, in this project of sort of explaining computational thinking, I actually thought this one was going to be easy, but they never are. And it's, it's, you know, kind of, and I never, you know, any project where I'm absolutely confident that I, that it's going to work and it's going to be easy is usually not my favorite project. It's kind of the ones, you know, it's always, it's always a little bit difficult. Like another project I'm doing right now, I think I'm writing entitled, Can AI Solve Science? And um, that ends up being a, again, it's a, it's pretty, it's a pretty interesting issue. It's, it, it depends on what you mean by science. It depends on, and then there's a lot of technical stuff about what you can actually do with AI. The bottom line is it can, things that humans can sort of reach, it can reach more efficiently. Things that are sort of blocked by computational irreducibility, it's as out of luck as anything else is. And it just will, you know, pick at that brick wall and not be able to get anywhere. But, um, uh, you know, in terms of, of education, you know, I, I sort of, I suppose a hobby of mine is trying to understand more about education, particularly of folks younger than you guys, but, but, um, uh, trying to, uh, trying to think about, well, my, my, one of the things I think is important is forget kind of computational thinking. Let's just start with thinking to begin with, because a lot of education is not really about thinking. It's about learning some mechanical skills that allow you to do some particular thing. And by the way, in the time of AI and so on, I mean, it's a little bit oversold right now, but, but in the time of AI, you're kind of the value of knowing those mechanical skills is going to go down. You know, people, people like me have been trying to automate whatever can be automated. We've been trying to automate and a lot of those mechanical skills are very automatable. What's non-automatable is the question of, so where do you want to go next? Because that's the thing that inevitably is sort of a human choice. And kind of knowing what's out there and being able to make those choices, that's a, an inevitably human thing. But I think that this this uh, this kind of 
you know, in terms of education, the value of kind of deeply sort of specific skills-based education, I think is going to go down. I think the liberal arts story will rise in, in, the, in the next few years. I think, uh, you know, it was kind of a shock that like, oh my gosh, you know, programming, everybody can make a living being a programmer. Well, no, they can't because we're about to automate a bunch of that. I mean, I've been working on automating that for a long time. We've got a long way in doing that. And that's, you know, that's not something you need high-priced humans to do, so to speak. It's um, uh, so, you know, the value of kind of liberal arts education and learning, for me, it's learning to think and learning about a lot of different things. Because somehow, as you think about things, kind of, it's like, oh, that reminds me of this thing over there in biology, or that reminds me of this thing over there in law or, or, or whatever else. It's super useful. That's the, that's the kind of grist that I think you need to be able to really think well about lots of kinds of things. And, but you know, computational thinking is this formalization of thinking, which happens to connect you to the superpower of actually getting computers to calculate things for you. And that's, um, that's I think, important, but it's not, you know, it's not the only story. Um, I will say that um, um, I think, uh, well, yeah, I mean, there's, there's more to, um, um, you know, I think, I think it's, a, you know, to, you talk about learning about, you know, reading Plato and so on. You know, I would say that an example of a place that is kind of a, a terrible vacuum in the world today that um, uh, is about to be a collision of the, the techiest of technology with kind of the most philosophical of philosophy, so to speak, is the whole question of AI governance, AI ethics, these kinds of things. And this question of, you know, if the AIs run the world, how do we want them to do that? How do we think about that process? What's the kind of modernization of political philosophy in the time of AI? These kinds of things. And this kind of goes right back to foundational questions that, you know, Plato talked about and so on. In fact, one of my projects for myself in, is uh, reread Plato's Republic because I want to know what he actually had to say about some things. Um, the, uh, um, because I don't think, you know, one of the shocking things about these questions of political philosophy and so on is, you know, we're still humans the same way we were a couple thousand years ago, and many of the issues are exactly the same. And, you know, maybe in time there will be sort of uh, fundamental changes in the human condition, but we're not there yet. And um, uh, so, in any case, I, I think, you know, one of the sort of vacuums in the world, and it, it is a shocking vacuum because I've been sort of exposed to kind of policy making about AI and things like this, is you would be amazed at the level of, of philosophical naivete that people have in, uh, in thinking about sort of what it means. Like, for example, you know, a, a not uncommon thing for people to say is, well, we'll just teach the AIs to do the right thing. It's like, okay, you know, where do we go from here? What, you know, what is the right, how do people agree what the right thing is? What does it even mean? You know, and, and, and you kind of, uh, you know, maybe at, at one level you get some utilitarianism of, of kind of, you know, it's like, well, we'll get the AI to figure out what would make the most people happy. Was well, that really what you want? You know, there are all kinds of issues with that, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you get questions like, uh, well, does the AI, does the AI have rights? Do you want the AI, do you want to think about the AI in a, in a kind of, like a person. You say, no, it's just a bag of bits. Who cares? We can just switch it off. It's all good. And then you realize, well, what if that AI is a bot that just made friends with 10,000 people? Well, then they'll be pretty upset if you just switch it off. And, and so, it, you know, you quickly start realizing that it's a more complicated question. And um, anyway, there's, there's, a, there's a, a large depth of this. And I will tell you that, that um, in terms of what's out there in the world and in the, in the kind of intersection between sort of, you know, to me, this is kind of the several hundred year opportunity for philosophy is what's needed right now is how do we rethink things like democracy, for example, in the age of AI, you know, thought experiment. You say, you know, in democracies, people vote for things, right? They check boxes, whatever else. But that's a very coarse way to say what you want. Maybe what we need is a promptocracy where everybody writes a prompt for the great big AI that's that's running the world type thing. 
and you get you know a billion prompts and everybody's written an essay about what they want in the world you feed this to this big ai and then every decision that gets made it's up to the ai to try and sort of uh you know operate within those prompts and maybe you even think about you say well what about if those prompts say you know 90% of them say do this 10% of them say do that what do you then do well then you realize it's sort of a recursive thing because the prompts themselves can contain what people's view of how they want kind of utilitarianism to work out is you get this kind of strange recursive view but but there's a you know these are things which you know if plato had had an ai plato would probably have been thinking about um but uh you know this is this is the sort of the the challenge for today is um uh, is you know how do you think about those kinds of things and these are things where as i say in in the actual world it's a terrible vacuum of people not you know really uh, sort of not knowing about um uh uh you know having a, a very i mean i could i could relate horrifying discussions that I've had with people who run the various kind of uh, companies that that are you know responsible for sort of putting AI into the world, sort of the, the attempted Socratic discussion about how you think about these kinds of issues, and you would be shocked at the extent to which people are not thinking clearly about these issues. Now I don't know how to resolve these issues. That's the challenge, but it's a place where sort of these kind of philosophical questions I think are of very current importance. Thank you very much, Dr. Wolfram. Uh, other, I see that uh, Rumi has a question. Over to you, Rumi. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Wolfram. Uh, so happy to have you here. I so I actually come from a STEM background, from a data science background. So I have some background in the AI and I have some background now in the humanities. And I agree with what you had to say that people in STEM are sometimes hard to talk to regarding humanities and AI ethics. So I guess my question is, what frameworks, perhaps, or maybe what things from the humanities? Do you perhaps see would be beneficial to bring into the STEM world? And how can we actually engage in better conversation when it comes to AI ethics and AI application? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that, uh, you know, just thinking about things is something which sometimes in the STEM world isn't as present as you might imagine. Because it's like, I'm going to write this piece of code, I'm going to solve this math problem. It's very much on a track. And the idea that there is a general problem to solve that involves general thinking isn't really there. You know, I noticed one thing, a lot of interesting phenomenon. I, you know, I talk about a bunch of science things with lots of kinds of people, and I'll talk about them with very technical scientists, and then I can, I can yatter away with all kinds of fancy jargon and so on, which allows me to jump a little bit in what I'm explaining. But the, uh, and, and then I'll talk to people who are more sort of philosophy background type people. This is what I've noticed. It's a funny phenomenon. The scientists have an easy time with the technical stuff, but when it comes to conceptual change or conceptual leaps, they just don't get it at all. They're like they're just not used to that. They're not used to the idea that there could be, you know, very different ways to think about things. That is much more familiar in kind of the philosophical tradition than it is in the scientific tradition. The scientific tradition tends to be, you know, you're on this track and you're going further and further and further down the track. But you're not, um, you know, the idea that there could be a completely different track is not one that tends to enter. And I think that's a that's a sort of meta thing from sort of at least the philosophical end of the humanities that I think is important. I, I will say that, you know, tell a story, a little bit of a story in, in you know, Building Wolf Alpha, this system that has a lot of knowledge about the world. And, you know, as a practical matter, we... You know, we'd hire people to do sort of teach it about different aspects of the world. And one of the problems that we had beginning years ago now is, you know, you have people who are technically sophisticated and you realize that the, um, I don't know, they're doing something where they're dealing with data about, who knows what, volcanoes or something. Okay. And, and you realize that, yes, they followed the track. They did this and this and this. But if you thought about it a little bit more broadly, you realize, this has to be complete nonsense. You know, there can't be a, I don't know what, you know, a, a, um, uh, a volcano at the North Pole that you've never heard of type thing that's there because the coordinate system has a singularity and you have, uh, you know, the data uh, did something funky there. Um, you know, 
it's this idea that you can actually think about the world as opposed to just think about the the abstraction of the world that you have in, for example, um, doing kind of low level programming. That seems to be a thing that is a uh, you know. So so in fact, if you look at you know in our company, as this is, I'm thinking for a second, I think the people who lead those groups are basically mostly people with humanities backgrounds, not people with with uh, you know pure STEM backgrounds. Just because that's um, it, you know, it, it, it's sort of thinking about the world is is useful, and um, it's it's not just a I'm going to write this next line of code type thing. I see a question over there in the 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 trinity of people on the porch at Musgrove House. Over to you all. Yes, thank you, thank you, Dr. Blackwood. Um, thank you, Dr. Wolf, for, for being here. I, I want to pick up on the on the Republic again. I believe it's in Book Four where Plato says that explicitly that once we establish a successful program of education for the youth, that we ought to never introduce innovation because it would destabilize the, the whole program and it would jeopardize its its uh, prospects for success. So I was wondering if you could still mend the case. I'm thinking about the future um, of Humanity Institute and, and some proposal for slowing down research in artificial intelligence and similar fields. I was wondering if you could still mend the case for, let's say, abandoning ship and trying a different path forward. Uh, and, and and again, if you could then maybe yeah, okay. still mend so, the other side as well. Thank a, you. A I didn't know that quote from Plato. That's interesting. Actually, a friend of mine who's a classics professor in Oxford wrote a book about um, innovation in ancient Greek times. And um, uh, it, um, so I'm, I'm, um, um, and you know, the view of innovation in the past, which is very different from the view of innovation today. I mean, we live in a time today when sort of innovation is assumed, you know, the future is assumed to be different from the past, so to speak, which I guess has not always been true. Now, you know, this question of, uh, uh, you know, is innovation always a good thing? Interesting question. Um, one, one thing to realize it comes back to this whole computational irreducibility idea is you'll never know what's going to happen. Unexpected things will always happen. And there are many aspects to that. It's kind of why the passage of time is, is why something is achieved by the passage of time. If nothing surprising ever happened, if you could always say, this is what's going to happen, then there's nothing meaningful about the passage of time. We probably wouldn't feel that we had any kind of free will. We'd just be saying, we know what's going to happen. There's nothing. There's no freedom in what's going to happen. So that's a that's kind of a a um, uh, uh, and I think you know goes along with that. There will always be more inventions to be made. We will never have gotten to the point where we've invented everything that could be invented. Now there's a little bit of a footnote to that because we know that as a kind of fact about the sort of the computationally formalized world that there will always be new inventions that can be made. What is not so obvious is that humans will continue to care about. It could be the case that we get to the point where it's like life is good, you know, we've got everything we need, nothing has to change, you know. People, people say that there are, you know, you know, tribes at different times who've gone for you know thousands of years where sort of it's just nothing much happened, and their activities, at least to the outside, look like these kind of ritualistic activities, just kind of uh, uh, passing the time, so to speak. So it is. Certainly possible. I, I think that doesn't work either because I think what happens is that the nature of the world is such that it will always throw up the unexpected. That is just the progress of physics. So progress of the physical world, what happens in the physical world. You know, an asteroid will arrive that you didn't expect or whatever else. Something will always happen you didn't expect. And so that's a driver. Even if you said, we're happy, we're done, you know, all is good. We don't want the world to ever change. The world will change, will force you to change because it will change, just as uh, because of that's the nature of the physical universe. So, you know, this question of whether whether we, uh, you know, we say let's stop now, let's not invent anything else. Um, I think, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think that's uh, well. You know, to to talk about the the situation with AI, I'm just imagining I was. Um, uh, this um, this movie called Dune, that I guess a new piece of just came out today. Um, I, I happen to know the director of that thing, and because we we uh, 
we did some work on this movie called Arrival, which he made um, a few years ago. And um, uh, it's kind of, we contributed some some computational kinds of things to Arrival. And it's like, hey, do you need something similar in Dune? It says, well, actually in Dune, AI has been outlawed. There are no computers. And the only thing there are are, are humans who can compute things. Right, so so that's so this is a fictional world in which in which AI has been outlawed. I think the um, uh, this question of whether you know whether we stop progress, the history of stopping progress in uh, you know well there's certainly well okay so it is perhaps a way to think about it. You know, one of the questions that we have right now is we want to tell the AIs how we want them to act. We want a certain kind. Of, we might think we want some kind of AI constitution that says to the AIs, this is how you should act. Well, let's imagine that the AIs are very powerful. They're kind of godlike powers. And we say, we're going, we get to define, you know, the constitution now for the AIs. Well, they're very powerful. So if in that constitution, we might say, we want to constrain the AIs to work just this way and not another way. In a sense, what we're doing by saying that is we want to end history. We want to basically say, this is the way things are going to be forevermore. And obviously, there are cultural traditions, whether you're looking at you know major religions or whatever else, where it's like, here's the book, follow this book. And in a sense, what we'd be doing with AI, in the case where we say, you know, this is the AI constitution for the all-powerful AI, this is how we want it to be. Now, now you know, when you think about the world as it is, the, you know, we think about something like governments, Governments are, in some sense, a machine that uh, happens to be operated with people rather than with you know computational automation. It's a thing with all these regulations and laws and things like this. And again, it's this question of you know what, what you know to what extent do you want to have the possibility of change? And as soon as you say, well, you know, where's the change going to come from? The change is not if you say to the AI, just go change every so often. Well. Just like I was showing those kind of random, uh, you know, programs running in the computational universe, the AI will wander around the computational universe. The, the AI has no, you know, we humans have certain things that we care about, and we are sampling a tiny fraction of the computational universe. I did a little experiment. I could show you a picture, but you can probably imagine it with a generative AI generating images, and the the. Um, uh, you can kind of, by changing the parameters of the AI, you can have it generate images of different kinds of things. Let me see if I can see that, find that picture. Oh, yeah, there we go. Okay. So this is showing, went a bit fast. It's showing in the space of, in a sense, possible concepts for an AI. It shows, let's see, at the beginning here, we are forming a cat. We've asked it to make a cat in a party hat. And then we're kind of moving away from that cat and we're moving out in concept space. And we're moving to a place where, you know, I call this cat island. This is kind of the, 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 the place where the concept of a cat is at the center. We're moving away from that. And so we can ask the question, in this space of all possible concepts, uh, kind of what fraction of it have we given words to? Have we said, that's a cat, that's a dog, versus all this stuff out here which just looks like random gunk. And so it's about one part in 10 to the 600 is stuff we've given words to so far. So there's a lot out there for the AI to explore, so to speak, which we don't yet have human words for. So if you just say to the AI, go explore, go do what you feel like, it's going to wander around and it's going to do things. And, and by the way, we've already seen something like this because nature also has this feature. It goes and just does what it does. Some of it is stuff we say that's very meaningful, what nature is doing. Some of it, that's a big nuisance. We like it. We can use it, whatever else. But nature just does what it does. And so would the AI, if left to its own devices. So what we're really talking about is AIs that have been kind of uh, sort of constrained to follow human purposes. And that's uh, and kind of that's, that's what we're... Um, so, you know... If we ask the question, if we say, okay, let's, you know, this this idea of let's stop, um, you know, well, as I say, I, I'm 
I don't think it's a practical thing to to sort of say, let's just stop progress, so to speak. I mean, there are a small number of cases in, in history where that's happened, like nuclear weapons development, for example, is one that's probably a pretty good thing where that has been slowed down. But that's a very different case from something like AI. The supply chain for making a nuclear weapon is long and complicated and involves, you know, mining uranium out of the ground and stuff like this and and doing building big machines that do things. AI is not like that. AI is something that, you know, everybody can do it. It's a bit more similar to cryptography. There's another area that in the uh, in the 80s, for example, there was a thought, let's just shut it down. Let's not have people be able to to make, you know, uh, sort of secret messages. Let's just have it be the case that sort of that that's that's not been allowed. Um, there was an attempt to do that. It kind of failed, and you know, cryptography is everywhere. And you know, I don't know whether you sort of. It's an interesting question whether it's been good for the world, bad for the world. I don't know. It's a mixed bag. It's complicated. But it's but the idea of stopping that progress, I think, is unrealistic. Um, and uh, you know, as a practical matter, my friends and some of the larger AI companies, they'd love to stop progress because they're already there. And that's a great way to build kind of a moat around your your castle, so to speak, is to say, we're the only ones we can get here. And everybody else is is, you know, can't um uh isn't allowed to do it. I think that's that's been a, you know, I think people kind of saw that regulatory capture move uh, you know, in, in other industries it's been less obvious, but in this one it's like Come on, everybody knows that's what's going on. This is not a, this is not, you know, a for the good of the world type type story. Um, it, it's um, so I mean, I think that that the the real challenge is actually around computational irreducibility, and here's why: we have a choice. We can say let's constrain our computational systems to only act in ways where we can predict what they'll do, or where we know that they won't do the wrong thing. That's choice number one. Then they can't do much. They can't do irreducible computations. As soon as they're doing irreducible computations, we can't say what's going to happen because that's kind of the point of it being an irreducible computation is you just have to run it to see what happens. So a big societal sort of issue, which I'm sure there's going to be a big sort of divide about, is you know do we let the computational systems do their thing and you know operate as if they have a mind of their own, so to speak? Or do we put all these constraints on them and thereby prevent us from having the, you know, the advantages of sort of the power of computation? And I'm sure just as there are different sort of cultural conclusions people make about different things, that will be, you know, that will be a big divide. Now, you know, we can see that in practice. If you look at, you know, the chat GPTs of this world, when it first came out, the people who built it didn't know it was going to work. They didn't put a lot of, you know, oh my gosh, let's make sure it doesn't say the wrong thing, right? Constraints in that. Over time, more and more of those constraints have been added, and the thing's gotten dumber as a result. You know, because it's more constrained, it's less able to to sort of make use of its computational capabilities. So I think this is a, you know, it's a big kind of, you know, that's that's a big issue of, you know, how much how much can we let the world be unpredictable? And that's a question which didn't come up much in the past because the world was unpredictable. You know, in, in antiquity, kind of like fate governs everything. We never know what's going to happen. And now we live in an age where, you know, science supposedly answers everything and everything is predictable, except it isn't because of computational irreducibility. And and that's a um, you know, this coming to terms with, you know, is everything predictable? You know, we saw this a bunch in the pandemic. Of you know, are we going to be able to predict all these epidemiological things? Okay, you know, some of us knew the answer to that was absolutely not. You know, it's a it's a quintessential computational irreducibility story. You're just going to have to see what happens. And this idea that we can kind of lock everything down and predict everything is an idea of of kind of a a phase of science that was you know that started in the late 1600s and has had a big run, but it's not the whole story of science. And and so I think that's um, um, you know that, that's that's the um, that's sort of the big big issue is is how much uh, I, you know just to say that that in the past nature did what nature did and people just sort of said well you know 
I don't know, the sea level is changing. We're going to move and, and graze our sheep somewhere else, uh, you know, in the next generation or whatever else. It wasn't a big deal. It's now, it's kind of like, we should be able to predict everything. We should lock everything down. We should know exactly what's going to happen. And we're not just sort of going with the flow of what nature is doing. We expect we can know everything. I think that is just not correct. And it's something that people, it's kind of, it's kind of charming that in a sense that science got to the point where people believe in it so much that they sort of believe everything is predictable. Please, another another hand is up. So. Go ahead, uh, Jake. Okay, there we go. Um, what you're saying reminds me a lot of uh, Nassim Taleb's book, The Black Swan. I don't know if you've read that before, but but the, the concept of unknown unknowns and uh, and sort of the the network of probability that comes out of that is, is very fascinating. And and I have a sort of a pet theory that I don't have any real substantiation for other than maybe a bit of my, my background in genetics, but, but let me put it by you. That's that the, the universe is fundamentally constituted by, uh, by gradients of probability that everything is at the fundamental level, a gradient of probability, which introduces both predictability in the sense that things can trend in certain ways, but also fundamental irreducible unpredictability, which gives us the uh, the emergent phenomena of difference just everywhere, and and through optionality, um, we get the the varied forms of, of the universe. And and I want to ask you if that makes sense, and and what you think of it, and if you think it's even relatively correct, or or if it's if it's a blowing smoke, and and what do you think? Well, the, okay, the uh, consequences are. So I happen to know Nassim Taleb fairly well, and um, although one of the terrible things about knowing people is you often don't read their books actually, um, because you know, I've I've heard him talk about I've talked to him about these things, and uh, I I I I bet he hasn't. He he uses our, our technology a bunch, but I bet he hasn't read books I've written either. So so it's a it's a mutual uh, mutual story. But um, uh, you know, with respect to you know, probability is a weird concept because probability is stuff you don't know about. In other words, you know, you could say. The universe just does this particular thing. Well, you can say, all I'm going to say is there's a probability it does this. When you say there's a probability, you're kind of saying there's stuff I don't know, and it could come out this way or it could come out that way. And so, you know, I tend to think that any, you know, models of the world that are fundamentally probabilistic, where it's probability all the way down, uh, I think it will be disappointing if that's how things actually work, because to me there is a, a a contingent aspect to things. We are, for example, at the physical position that we're at, and that's an arbitrarily chosen thing in some sense. Um, that's where we get we choose this aspect of the universe rather than that, but not oh outside the universe somebody is rolling a dice, and you know. And figuring out what's going to happen in the universe. I mean that that's. I mean my 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 own view is that that sometimes probability is a reasonable way to describe things, but at the fundamental level, it would be nice. It would be it, it is it is to say that we haven't reached the fundamental level. If we're talking about probabilities, it's we're saying we haven't gotten to the bottom because there's still things we don't know that we're just having to say it could be this, it could be that with a certain probability. So that's that's um, uh, you know that's my view of that. I mean, th that's not to say that it isn't a pretty good dis you know could have a fine description of the world as we experience it by saying well we obviously don't know everything about what's happening we're we're very computationally bounded and so on. So what uh, you know and and, and how does some um, uh, that's something where we can perfectly well describe it in terms of probabilities. But anyway, my my two cents worth about that. Um, uh, that way of thinking about things. Um, I mean, I think that um, the the concept. I think some of Nassim's black swanery is is not unrelated to the whole computational irreducibility story. Um, and uh, I don't know. Nassim and I have done a couple of live streams talking about stuff. And maybe in those few hours of live streams, we've we've uh, we've uh, explicated these issues. But I'm not sure. I think I think there there's there's quite a bit to to dig through there. Please, another question. I think Jay, question over to you. 
Thank you. Uh, I'm very curious to hear more of what you think about the nature of mind. I know a few of us here are interested in the project of accounting for human interiority, what it means to have a soul or a self or to experience consciousness. And do you have any reason to doubt that these things can be accounted for by a computational framework? Right. I mean, I think, first I'll make a comment about souls, which I just find interesting. You know, when I was a kid, you know, I grew up in England where there's sort of things like, you know, Church of England, the religious education type stuff. And it's kind of like, you know, I wasn't a big believer in these things. And it's like, oh, souls, you know, how can you take souls seriously? You know, how much does a soul weigh? It's a typical question. Well, I realized later on that that was a stupid question because, you know, the concept of a soul was a description of what we would now think of as kind of the computational essence of a mind, something that is permanent in a sense. It is independent of the particular details of, you know, the way that our neurons are made up and so on. You know, the soul of, you know, the human might be as well captured in some artificial neural network. That is the kind of, it, you know, that is the immortal soul is this abstract thing. So now the question is our internal experience of the world to what, you know, does one imagine? So, so one thing that I think we, we just got a bunch of evidence this last year that there isn't more mystery to how minds work, human minds work. You know, people would have said, you know, a year and a half ago, people would have said, oh, there are all kinds of things that human minds do and we don't know what's going on. And, you know, maybe there's quantum mechanics in the mind and the brain. And, you know, maybe there are all these molecular processes we don't understand. And after all, we do amazing things like we, we make up human language and we are able to write essays and things like that. Well, now we know that it, all it takes to do uh, you know, a possible job of that is a simple neural network. So we, we know that some aspects of brains, there isn't mystery down at the bottom of how brains are working, I don't think. So then the question is, what is the experience? What is the inner experience of a computer, for example? I was actually trying to write something. I started a couple of years ago, and I need to finish it. Well, what it's like to be a computer. And it's kind of like, think about sort of the in inner experience of being a computer. And it's actually shocking how similar it is to our human inner experience. I mean, the time from when a computer boots up to when its operating system crashes, it's kind of like a single human lifetime. And you're kind of, you, you remember certain things, things happen to you, you have inner thoughts. It's kind of like, you know, how do we distinguish the inner feelings of the computer, so to speak, from the ones that we have as, as, as humans and so on? I think the uh, uh, it's kind of it's kind of fun to 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 think about the what it's like to be a computer thing, and to say you know oh the computer's just a bag of bits. Well, we're just a bag of bits, and you know we have electrical signals in our brains and to do this or that. Before the ChatGPT stuff, for example, we might have imagined that there was still further down to go that there were mysterious processes in brains whose physics we didn't know. I don't think that's the case. I think it's pretty clear that's not the case. So then the question is, well, what, uh, you know, this, this idea of kind of our inner experience, how does it work? I would say in terms of the concept of consciousness, the, for me, I'm a consumer of that concept in the sense that the observer, because I think that the universe appears the way it appears because we are observers of the kind that we are, one feature of us as observers is we believe we have this thing we call consciousness. And for example, this idea that we have a single thread of experience is very related to our idea that we are conscious. You know, when you talk to, you know, a neurosurgeon, you say, what aspect of brains, if you disconnect it, will make consciousness not be there? They'll start talking about the attention mechanisms and so on that exist in brains to kind of concentrate all the different kinds of sensory inputs we have and make us feel that there is a definite thing going on in, in our lives, so to speak. And I think that's a, that's a sort of a feature of, of what's special about, about minds as opposed to any other computational thing seems to be this kind of concentration. I mean, so one of the things you might have thought is minds are the most amazing things in the universe. What I've concluded is that minds are a particular kind of thing that exists in the universe that is restricted in a bunch of ways. It's not, it's computationally bounded. 
it believes it's persistent in time. Those are very important. If we were not, okay, so here's a, a thought experiment. Imagine we were not computationally bounded. Imagine that we could experience everything in the universe. I think, so, so for example, as we, we talk about this idea of real space, the idea of kind of thinking different ways to think about the world, and we say, how do we expand our presence in rural space? In physical space, we expand our presence by sending out spacecraft and things. In rural space, we expand our presence by understanding more about how the world could work, by understanding new, new paradigms and so on. So you might say, well, what's the future of humanity? Maybe it's to colonize the whole Ruliad, to extend our domain of, um, of, kind of, uh, of, of thinking to encompass sort of everything that can be there. What you realize is, if you do that, you do not really co coherently exist. By the time you're everything, there is nothing that is the thing that represents you, so to speak. So it's kind of a, it's, and I, I think this is reflected, I, I've been trying to learn this stuff, but I think it's reflected in a bunch of kind of Eastern philosophy thinking about these kinds of things that, you know, by the time you reach everywhere, you are nowhere, so to speak. And and you can kind of see those those sorts of um, so I mean in um, uh, yeah so I mean that that's a to me consciousness is a is a restriction on you know is is we're concentrating on some particular aspect of what computations can go on in the universe and by the way that those aspects sort of drive why we perceive the universe to be the way it is. You know, I've been very interested in this kind of alien minds question, what it would be like to have, you know, to be a mind not like our minds, what it would be like to be, you know, what, uh, well, even among, you know, the, the critters of the earth, so to speak, you know, if your main way of interacting with the world is not visual, but olfactory, for example, what do you conclude about how the world works? What, um, uh, you know, how do you, how do you get inside an alien mind, so to speak? And take a different point of view about the world, and I, I think I I don't feel like I've been at all successful in in understanding that. I mean, for example, that that thing with a bunch of pictures of cats was an attempt to do that because what I did there was um, not the thing I showed you, but a different part of that was you train an AI based on five billion images that humans have put on the web. Then you say, let me take that AI that I trained, and it has a mind with certain neural connections and so on. And let me change its mind, so to speak. Let me modify the structure of its mind. What does it then imagine? What does it then imagine a cat in a party hat looks like? And what you see is kind of amusing. You know, you can like change the weights and the neural nets and so on, and you can quite literally blow the mind of the neural nets. And it's really kind of bizarre because you see these images of cats and they really are just blowing up, kind of psychedelically blowing up and then then dissipating completely. And um you know, I, I I suspect that that's you know that's a that's the beginning of seeing kind of like what and how the mental images of alien minds basically, um. But yeah, these are I mean, look, these are these are for sure interesting questions, and I think they they actually come back to reflect on all these questions about you know when do AIs get rights? How do we think about sort of AI in the context of of human um uh you know sort of human flourishing and so on. I mean, I you know, to give an example of an unworked out thing that I've been been pondering recently, one of the issues with you know systems of laws and setups, and I'm sure Plato talked about this. I don't know exactly what he said was was that you know you can have human laws, and you know if people violate them, you do bad things to those people, and you have the idea that people are not going to want bad things to happen to them, so they're not going to violate these laws. Now. The fact that it is, in a sense, an extrapolation to say we see we did something bad, we killed somebody, whatever else, that that it's an extrapolation from our own internal feelings that that will feel bad to that person. But let's assume that's correct. Question is for AIs, well, we don't imagine they have any inner feelings. We don't imagine from the outside that they don't have any inner feelings. It's not obvious that's true. I mean, that's what it's like to be a computer is the question. You know, for me... You know, how do I know that you have inner feelings, so to speak? Well, how do I know that an AI has inner feelings? You know, an interesting thing, a friend of mine just built a, uh, a strange humanoid robot that um, uh, is, um, 
uh, for for various reasons. I I saw like three weeks ago, and it showed up, and we were at a, a restaurant with this weird humanoid robot that has sort of realistic eye motions and all this kind of thing. It was really interesting seeing people come up to this thing and start talking to it and and talking about it and so on. And you know, if one thought that humans will not anthropomorphize a thing like that, one is wrong. The, you know, the typical, you know, based on at least that sample, people treated us as hum- a human-like thing, and that was that was a kind of a, uh, you know, it's it's very easy to to have anyway. But but so this question about so I, I kind of have this proto theory of um, uh, you know even if the the AI you know does not feel pain so to speak, if the AI is cut out of society. For the purposes of the rest of society, the AI got killed. And so if you can set up a mechanism whereby you are sort of the, the network of AIs, maybe it's easier to think about AI governance, AI ethics for a society of AIs than for an individual AI. And that's that's kind of a, a, a um, but I haven't figured out how to do it. You know, I, I have to say in modern times, I just a couple of days ago got one of these uh, Apple VR headset type things, and um, it is an interesting. You know, I think that's a that's a moment where the it's a very Plato cave like moment because this thing, you know, you put this thing on, and it, you know, you don't see anything intrinsically. Everything you see is processed by this device, and you know, so you can see, you know, the the image that you are seeing is. You know, a camera taking in the you know the photons and producing an electrical signal, and then display displaying it, and that means you can just change what you know you can change reality very very easily. And it is interesting to see sort of the the I don't know at least my kind of almost emotional response to that situation. Like you put yourself in a nice natural scene where you know everywhere around you is is you know out in nature. It has a certain Different visceral feeling from you know just looking at your computer screen or whatever else. Anyway, I think it's a it's a this uh, sort of the the virtualization of everything is um, uh, is is rapidly upon us, and um, you know the cave is becoming quite quite real quite quickly, so to speak. Um, and you know that's a it's an issue of how one thinks about sort of the human condition and um, and human motivation and things like this in a in a situation where where there's that kind of virtualization. Well, I know we're starting out of time. Another, another. I know our time is running, uh, 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 running out, and uh, uh, that in this group of students uh, there would be a bottomless uh, number of questions on precisely these matters about whether everything can be reduced to computation, about uh, 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 the relativity of time and the possibility of uh, friendship, uh, kinship, let's say, through time uh, with uh, people uh, and minds in the past. I know there are some very rich questions in the in the room around consciousness and the status of our will, uh, but there's no way in two minutes we're going to get through all of those. I hope that we'll be able to have you back, Stephen. And just as we conclude, I'm wondering if I can ask you uh, for any uh, any reflections or advice that you might offer to our students about about your own approach to learning in life and and what has characterized the most productive time uh, in your own uh, education. Or your own uh, self-taught uh, trajectory. Yeah, I mean, for me, I'm always. What's a question I want to answer? Let me learn what I need to know to answer that question. Is the is the you know is the thing that usually has driven me, and it's it's you know I guess when I was a kid, I don't know maybe I uh, you know I could see these books about physics or whatever else, and they'd have exercises in them. And I was never in the slightest bit interested in any of the exercises because I figure, you know, zillions of other people have done these. Why am I doing these? And so, you know, it's kind of like, but here's a question. I'm curious about this question. I have no idea whether this question is easy, undoable. You know, like there was one question I got interested in when I was 12 years old, and 50 years later, I finally wrote a book trying to answer that question this last year. So that 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 um, uh, it's um, uh, you know I, I would say that for me at least, being driven by sort of 
things that I'm curious about the answer to, and then learning around those things has been a much, for me, my particular sort of personal makeup, I find that much more effective than, you know, learn for the sake of learning. But, but I think it's, you know, these questions about, you know, one of the things that I think is nice about areas like philosophy is there's sort of questions around every corner. You know, one of the things that's often bad about sort of the STEM-like learning is, you know, well, here's a, here's a terrible thing to say. Let's talk about calculus, okay? There are calculus textbooks. They ask you to solve all kinds of problems, okay? What was the first calculus textbook? It was written by a guy called Colin McLaurin in 1727. If you look at that book, it had exercises. Many of those exercises are the same as the exercises in calculus books today. So in other words, it's like there's a certain set of questions you can ask, and while it is useful to oil the brain to be able to answer those questions, there's a certain closedness to what, what you get to, to talk about. And I think one of the things that's, that's nice about sort of the, the philosophical humanistic world is it, it does tend to be sort of unbounded in terms of the kinds of things you can talk about, and that's, uh, that's probably you know, that, that I would suspect is, um, I, you know, and for example, I'm in the situation right now that I've decided I need to learn more about philosophy. And um, uh, the um, philosophy is actually, you know, I've learned a lot of fields and philosophy is giving me a harder time than most, partly because the usually most fields I learn I often learn the history of these fields. I find it super useful to understand the history of fields because if you want to build new things in a field, knowing where the things that are there now came from is really worthwhile. Particularly if you think you figured out something that's different from what people thought they'd figured out before, if you know where it all came from, you say, look, they just made a mistake 100 years ago and they went on the wrong path and now we can see what would happen if you go on the right path. If you don't know what happened, you're constantly worrying wait a minute, maybe I just don't understand what they, what they were talking about. But what I found with philosophy, it's more difficult because in the case of most of these areas of science, it's kind of like this person figured out this thing and this is what they figured out. It's a little nice, you know, convenient box. In the case of philosophy, a lot of what, you know, what did Plato figure out, so to speak, it's not really in a box. It's really a big, you know, a big set of ideas that have all kinds of, you know, it's a living set of ideas, so to speak. And that's, that makes it more difficult for, you know, it's kind of not the who, what, who, who, where, who, when, what type question. It's a, it's a, it's a more nuanced kind of thing. And I, I, you know, I think that's some, um, uh, but it certainly brings up plenty of, um, uh, plenty of questions. I mean, you know, I, I've thought a bunch about, something Plato talked about a bunch about the reality of mathematics. And I think I, I understand quite a bit now about the extent to which mathematics is as real as physics. And uh, that's something that, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, the, look, the, the thing, you know, my particular way of learning things is probably, you know, everybody has different ways of learning things. Maybe the AI tutors will, will learn our individual learning styles and be able to tell us exactly the right thing. But uh, for the time being, it's, it's um, uh, I mean, for me, I need a project that I'm thinking about to drive learning that I'm doing. Then for me, sort of taking what I learned and making it computational is the way that I kind of cement my understanding of what's going on. And it's pretty cool when you do that because you then have this sort of superpower that allows you to take your understanding and leverage it a long way. So, I, I mean, I don't know. That, that's some, uh, uh, the, um, look, I would say, if I have a meta comment to make about this, it's around every question that's been asked a zillion times, there are questions that probably haven't been asked at all. And at least for me, those questions are often the ones that most motivate me. And I think particularly when it comes to areas like, you know, technology, philosophy, the interaction between those, it's a completely open area. You know, it's a, the, the fields go through these cycles of, you know, in science, for example, of technology, some methodology is invented, 
there's a period of rapid growth, then things stabilize for 100 years, and then there's another period of growth. You know, it's always cool to be involved in things during their golden age when there's just a lot of activity around them. I mean, I happened to be involved in, in particle physics when it was having its kind of golden age in the late 1970s. That was pretty cool. Because things that I invented when I was a kid, people still use them today, not because they are, you know, not because they're that amazing, but because I got to pick that low hanging fruit because I was the first one on the scene, so to speak, to, to be able to do that. Um, and, and now what I think is really interesting is these intersections between sort of philosophical kinds of questions and technological kinds of questions. And I, I, I will say that I just, as an observation about the world, I, you know, I run across lots of groups and, and so on where they're like, we need, you know, people to help figure this out and oops, there's nobody. And, and that, that's so, you know, to me, that's a big opportunity. Now, I don't know. It's, it isn't, I've thought about it. I haven't figured it out. So it's not easy, but it's a, you know, it's an area of great opportunity. So just a, a, a few thoughts there. And by the way, I, I, I want to just make a pitch for one thing. We, we have a, Please. Um, if people are interested in this, we have a, a summer school that we do every year. We've been doing for how long? 21 years now. And um, we actually are just adding a philosophy track to our summer school. We don't know how that's going to work. It's had, a, it's had various science tracks and technology tracks and so on, but we're adding a philosophy track. So if people are interested in that, check it out. Um, and uh, uh, that happens in late June, early July, I think. Um, in the Boston area. So what it's worth. Um, Thank you very much, uh, Stephen. Uh, it's it's really uh, a great uh, gift uh, that you've given us by uh, making time to come and join us today. I know that there would be uh, uh, many, many, many hours of conversation uh, that we would all greatly enjoy. We've run to the, to the limit of the time we have, but I will say that uh, the opportunity that you, I mentioned of our moment is one that we are going to, to do our best to rise to meet, and so we're very, very grateful for your uh, your time and the support you've given to the the college. Your friendship with this uh, fledgling enterprise has meant a great deal to us. And I know it's very difficult to give a round of applause on Zoom, but believe me when I say I know how grateful we all are for that. Thank you very, very much. Thanks. Nice to meet you all. <laughs>